so it was sealed. Okay, so here's the order sealing the papers. You, do you, are you starting to catch on to the flexibility of the sovereign? Okay, this is really a what, what I, I mean, this is fun stuff to read through in certain ways, but what I really want you to get out of it is that you are boss. Now, you've got to put on a good image. You want to follow procedures, but you don't want these guys to get away with stuff either. And so you want to be able to, to adjust to the situation as it calls for. <coughs> all right, so, all right, here's the order sealing papers. You can see what it looked like there. The court comes now to find that the matter before it is a personnel matter requiring the court's protection of the privacy of the persons herein named. The attached envelope containing papers pertaining to personnel matters is hereby ordered sealed. It may be opened only by this court or by the following persons. I hold the filings, that's the clerk, Roy Legume, that was the judge, or William Jones, that's the plaintiff. The, this order to seal may be countermanded either verbally or in writing, temporarily or permanently, at any time in or out of court session by I hold the filings and Roy Legume acting in common agreement between themselves. Okay? So we say, look, you guys, if you want to make it public, we're not going to stop you. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> and so, what's in the envelope? Well, a notice of motion, a motion for contempt, affidavit of William Jones, and affidavit of a, wit of a witness. <laughs> we had his actual name, of course. A copy of the caption page of each paper must be attached to the outside of the envelope. Okay? The court. Witness the seal of the court this 27th day of September, signed by William Jones, private attorney. This time we used English instead of Latin. Instead of privat, attornatus privatus, we said private attorney. It means the same thing. And we put the seal on it over on the right-hand side. A gold seal, because it's an order. All right, so that... I don't know. I don't know. It doesn't matter. Who's, who's it? Let me ask you this. Who's the sovereign? Who, who sets the rules? Who decides which side of the page is the best part? Yeah. That's right. Okay. So, we had a notice for... Notice of a motion for contempt, confidential personnel matter. Okay? And that's what we called it. So, here's the cover page. We said, Notice of Motion for Contempt. Confidential Personnel Matter. To all interested parties, please take notice, and so on and so on. We say where, you know, Department 666 of the above entitled court located at 1313 Bastille Street, Megalopolis, California. Okay? So on. It was actually in San Bernardino at their main courthouse. All right, then we have the motion for contempt. Now, contempts operate a little differently. Uh, what you do is you have an affidavit which says, here's what happened, and then you ask the court for contempt. And if they don't answer the affidavit, it's presumed true, right? Okay, so that's basically what that's about <clears throat> when you make that motion. All right. And we, so we made a motion. There it is. Comes now William Jones and moves the above entitled court. And then we space down and the remainder of the page is filled in order to force information on the next page. Why? Because this cover sheet goes on the outside of the envelope. And those little hash marks you see there or those, those uh, slants there, that's so to fill the page. That's how you fill a page. You put ten of those and that uses up the empty lines. Okay, that's the normal way of doing things. And then it says here, uh, comes now William Jones and moves the above entitled court to find I hold the filings, the deputy clerk of said court, and or Roy Legume, a magistrate of said court, to be in either civil contempt or criminal contempt or both, but not in misdemeanor contempt of the above entitled court. There's three kinds of contempts in California. You can have a civil contempt, you can have a criminal intent, or you can have a misdemeanor contempt. Misdemeanor contempt means jail time. Criminal contempt doesn't necessarily mean jail time, okay? So you have three. So what you've got to do is basically you've got to uh, 
uh, make your accusation with the affidavit and you make the motion and we explain it's a personnel matter. When, when you get, you can go on the website, 1215.org, and this case is on there, so you don't have to wait if you want to read the details. So I'm going to skip over these details. Okay? And then you have the affidavit of the witness saying exactly what happened. <coughs> All right. Then we had the contempt hearing. And we scheduled the contempt hearing for the same date that we had some other hearing with this judge. So, he's being judged, he's on trial for contempt, and he's sitting on the bench. Because he's not the tribunal. See, I don't care if we have a good judge or bad judge, frankly. Because any order he issues, I'm going to vacate. Okay. Transcript number four. This is the contempt hearing. Let's see, I guess we'll get down here. Okay. Okay, Mr. Jones there, fine. Says, Judge says, I don't see the other side, I guess. But this side, this issue doesn't concern the other side. Well, everything on a case concerns the other side. Jones says, okay. And the judge says, and they, well, they should have been noticed, really, but that's okay. <laughs> well, <laughs> what other hearings? I, 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 this is on your motion to have, I guess, myself, and I hold the filings. Uh, who is one of the supervising clerks to be held in contempt? That's correct. <laughs> And the court read, uh, you're, you're the moving party, moving papers and your statements, and I have all these documents in the file, and I did some research on this yesterday. Do you have anything you wish to add, Mr. Jones? That's a trap. Okay? That sucks you in. Mr. Jones said, the only question I have at this point in time concerns Ms. Filing's certified document, where she states that she was directed to do what she did. My question would be, who is the entity that ordered her to do so? I do, we, see, we, earlier we got that he had signed it. Right. But we don't know who talked to her and told her to put it in in the first place. So my question would be, who is the entity that ordered her to do so? I do not know who that would be at this time. Well, if you look in the file, there's a certificate in order of vacating documents which says filed June the 9th that I signed on June the 9th that bears my signature and it's in the file too, okay? And Mr. Jones says, well, you're the entity who directed her to do what she did? See, he tried to dodge around it. He stayed on point. Why did he stay on point? Because before he went into that courtroom, we reviewed exactly what he was there for. That's what helped you to stay on point. Okay. Uh, I said, says the judge, pursuant to the certificate of the clerk and good cause appearing, it is hereby ordered that the First Amendment action of trespass on the case is hereby vacated. Jones says, okay, I understand that aspect of the certification, but she states that she was directed to do so. Uh-huh, says the judge. <laughs> and Jones says, well, I wish to know the entity that directed her to do that. I did. I just said I did. The California Superior Court did. State of California. And Jones says, well, that's the only point I need to clarify at this point in time. In and for the County of Calamity, the Superior Court by myself, in and for the County of Calamity, it's right in the file. Jones says, it's, well, I didn't see that the way, the way it read. That's my inquiry. Anything you wish to add, says the judge? No, if anybody else has anything to say in the matter. The judge says, well, I do in terms of ruling. Well, okay. California, says the judge, and I've spoken to you before about, we may have a difference of legal opinion here, but I've spoken to you before about the fact that you brought the lawsuit in the state of California Superior Court and that you would therefore... You would, therefore, because nobody is compelling you to utilize our facilities, but you have chosen to file the lawsuit against the people who you had a traffic accident, allegedly had a traffic accident with some time ago. And, okay, now, anyway, he says, uh, jo Jones says, excuse me, would you speak up a little bit? Yes. You, I hope, you, by the way, that's a technique, psychologically, to gain control over the other person. Okay, it's subtle. But it is a technique. Okay. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> judge says, yes, you... I hope you don't have a tape recording going again, Mr. Jones. <laughs> I know I haven't. And judge says, well, I don't care. You have to ask. No, I'm, I'm asking because I cannot hear you. <laughs> says, if you do, I'll consider your question. I don't care, frankly, but you have to ask. And the rules of court, and I told you before, and that's what I'm trying to inform you of now. 
You've chosen this as your forum to bring the business dispute into. And when your lawsuit, your litigating is in the Superior Court, I notified you previously that I'm obligated because of my position, because you brought the lawsuit utilizing the Superior Court of the State of California, and I and nothing, nobody is compelling you to use this forum. I'm telling you that. And I've told you previously that the rules have to be followed as established by the California Judicial Council and the California State Legislature. When they adopted the California Code of Civil Procedure and those rules that govern our proceedings in the trial court, <coughs> California Code of Civil Procedure Section 1209, 1209, that's 1209, <coughs> provides a list of acts or admissions which constitute contempt. Section 1209 in no manner allows for a court to hold itself in contempt on the motion of a party to a case being heard by the court. Now, he's right. A court cannot hold itself in contempt. But the judge is not the court, is he? See? But you see how he's trying to slide out of this one. <clears throat> Another thing I want you to notice. We must have something here because why is he spending all this time discussing this? If he were really in charge, he would have just thrown us out. Right? So, that's just another little aspect of it. Okay. So, um, uh, let's see. Additionally, you have failed to claim that the clerk I hold of filings committed any of the acts or admissions that constitute contempt under Section 1209 of the California Code of Civil Procedure. Therefore, your motion is entirely devoid of, of merit and I so rule and deny the motion. So Jones says, uh, uh, okay, well, for the record, I object. Judge says, I understand that. Okay, says uh, Jones. Okay. Judge says, all right, I don't know when the next court hearing is, Mr. Jones. Well, at this point, there's a CMC scheduled for Monday. Monday, okay. And uh, so they, he gets a transcript from the, the gal and that's that. Okay. So that was the transcript. So, he established in the, in the one hearing who signed it. He established in the second hearing, hearing who ordered the clerk. All right? And we've now had the hearing, haven't we? Now comes the ruling on contempt. Now, it took us, see, from October 14th to February 2nd. So, you can bet we researched this. We covered a lot of territory. And here's the ruling. You're going to get a laugh out of this one. You'll see. All right. Here's the... Here it is. I think. This will help me a little. Okay. All right. <clears throat> Comes now the court to review the law, the facts, and the record, and to rule accordingly. Summary. Oliver Wendell Holmes once wrote, I long have said there is no such thing as a hard case. I am frightened weakly, but always when you walk up to the lion and lay hold, the hide comes off and the same old donkey of a question of law is underneath. <laughs> <laughs> Through unplanned circumstance, duty falls upon this court of record to lay hold of the lion, unhide the underlying question of law and do what is necessary to preserve the rights of the parties to orderly due process and the good conduct of the business of this court and to vindicate the authority and dignity of this court in the face of an apparent modern palace rebellion. You know, it's fun to write some of this stuff. <clears throat> the question before this court is whether acts of the accused persons are contempts of the authority of this court. According to the moving party's affidavit, the accused understood or should have understood that the court expected that the plaintiff would file a First Amendment action. According to the moving party's affidavit, the day following the filing of the First Amendment action, the accused conspired to remove the paper and did remove the paper from the official court records. The moving party requests that this court invoke its contempt powers to preserve the rights of the parties to orderly due process and the good conduct of the business of this court and to vindicate the authority and dignity of this court. Remember, that's what contempt is all about. Dignity and authority of the court. <clears throat> no objection as to the sufficiency of the affidavit was presented to this court during the fact-finding phase of the trial. During the conclusionary phase, the magistrate did opine his own personal view. However, an objection was raised and the objection was not overruled. 
but sustained by implication. Okay? He objected, didn't he? The, pla- the plaintiff objected to the, to the, uh, uh, the court's ruling, the judge's ruling, but the judge never came out and said, you're overruled. Okay, he just said, I understand that. You remember that? He said, I understand that. So, he did not contradict the plaintiff. Remember, in the backyard, the last kid who speaks wins. Okay? So, the last significant thing said was that he objected and the judge concurred. The judge said, I understand that. (coughs) Okay. So there was no objection to the sufficiency. And of course you see all these, uh, um, these uh, links here. These are footnotes that were on the actual paper. Okay. Where we cite certain, you know, transcripts and that sort of thing. Okay. So, <clears throat> ceiling rent. Although the contempt hearing is held in open court, the papers of this personnel matter are ordered sealed to protect the privacy of the subject persons. The ruling may be either verbally or in writing ordered unsealed any time in or out of court session by Roy Legomay, William Jones, or any court of record. <clears throat> On October 14, 1999, the motion for contempt presented by William Jones came before the above entitled court of record. Present were Roy Legomay as respondent and William Jones' as moving party. Roy Legomay also presided as magistrate. I heard the fi- filings did not appear, although she had been served notice. The following is organized into four sections. Judicial cognizance, findings of fact, discussion and conclusions of law, impeachment and penalty. Now, the judicial cognizance is different from judicial notice, remember? Judicial notice, you take facts into account, you kind of work it into the judgment, some apply, some doesn't, that's what you consider. Judicial cognizance, it's obligatory, it must be part of the decision. The decision must be in conformance with whatever the cogn- you're taking judicial cognizance of. <clears throat> okay. Judicial cognizance. That is, straight out of Black's Law Dictionary, judicial notice or knowledge upon, <coughs> upon which a judge is bound to act without having it proved <coughs> in evidence. It is the public policy of the state that public agencies exist and so forth as the people do not yield their sovereignty. That's that. Okay. And so there's that. Laws are organic, ordinary, either written or unwritten. A written law is that which is promulgated in writing and which, and of which a record is in existence. The organic law, let's see. Any judicial record may be impeached by evidence of a want of jurisdiction of the court or judicial officer, of collusion between the parties or fraud in the party offering the record in respect to the proceedings. Does that apply to this? Sure does. And then we go into sovereignty, what the meaning of sovereignty is. The people of this state uh, have rights by their own prerogative. Um, <clears throat> Declaration of Rights cannot, may not be construed to impair or deny others retained by the people. So far. So we're backing this up. <clears throat> and this, this whole section is on the law, on the various rules, laws, definition of court of record. We build the whole picture. This contempt ruling in your cases, when you put together your cases, is a tremendous resource where you're trying to lock down your uh, sovereignty. It's all right here. This is as complete as you could get. Okay? So I suggest that you really study this particular section. Okay? It's called Judicial Cognizance, Section 1 here. So I, we went over a lot of that stuff, so I'm going to skip over that and just go down to the further down. <clears throat> we do get into contempt. I think it's important that you see 1209 contempt, right? Now he said, he said that a court cannot find itself in contempt. Now obviously he's trying to slide under the protection of that of that claim. But here's what the actual code says. California Code and which we decree to be, right? Judicial cognizance. So we're saying this is, this is the law of the case, basically. And look at section 3 of that code, 1209. Misbehavior in office or other willful neglect or violation of duty by an attorney, counsel, clerk, sheriff, coroner, or other person appointed or elected to perform a judicial or ministerial service. 
They wouldn't come out and say judge, would they? <laughs> right. So, you see, it's right there. I'll tell you, I, when I read these codes, there's a marvelous consistency among them. Somebody's got brains. Somebody understands this stuff. You can see it in how these codes fit together. So, one of the things I knew about the creation of these codes is that the legislature passes this information over to the, um, the law review or the legislative review department. And there they're loaded up with attorneys and they review these things for consistency and so forth. So, as I studied it, I homed in on the idea that there were three groups of people who really understood this sovereignty thing. And they were the, legislature, the legislative committee that reviewed the creation of these things. Uh, not necessarily the other committees that are creating them, okay? But the legislative committee. The other was the judges of the Supreme Court and the appellate courts. And the third was, accidentally, people like you and me. Okay? That's what I kind of figured out. So, one day... I was sent on a mission up to uh, uh, Sacramento to do some legal research. And I said, heck, while I'm there, I'm going to stop in on the legislature and talk to some of these guys in the legislative committee. Okay? So I went in there in the law review committee. I went in there and I happened to be lucky and I got a hold of, uh, of one of the supervisors there. So I, I um, managed to capture five minutes of her time. She was very... Very polite, very nice lady. That, and she was an attorney and she was a supervising attorney. So I sat down and I started asking her some of these pointed questions. Well, in, in about ten seconds I figured out I had reached a well of ignorance. Okay? <laughs> this lady didn't have a clue. So that immediately changed my approach. I thought, you know, here I was hoping to really kind of pick some brains. And there was nothing there. <laughs> okay? And so, I, obviously, I changed my whole direction. So, I said, well, explain this process to me. What happens? You know, you get a, a, a law that's proposed and it comes over into your committee. What happens then? How do you consider it? I didn't tell her the part how I noticed this consistency and how they, you know, seem to understand that. I knew I was lost on that point. But, how, how, what happens? And she says, oh, he says, well, what we do is we have a meeting with the Supreme Court and they review it and they look at it and give us suggestions. So that narrowed it down to one group up there. Only the Supreme Court justices really understand this whole thing. The attorneys, with their defective schooling, don't. And they're hired into the legislature, but it's the judges that are keeping this system straight. And they're doing an excellent job, I think. I mean, they can't control all the bad laws that come through but they can certainly control the, the, the uh, through suggestion, and it's a powerful suggestion, the inconsistency. Okay? And they do a good job of that. And so, here it is. Here's an example of one of those, one of those keeping it straight. They wanted to protect the judges, but they didn't really want to let them off the hook. Okay? They did not want to destroy the other system. We are the other system. And so, they, so what they did is rather than say a judge outright, they just said, uh, or other person appointed or elected to perform a judicial or ministerial service. Well, the average guy reading this would, you know, it gets heavy reading to read this stuff and you could miss it easily. Okay, so sk skipping down past that, <clears throat> there's other codes here and so forth. All right, now we had a finding of fact. <clears throat> Thank you. The court finds the following facts to be certain. Plaintiff had leave of court to file a First Amendment action. Failure to file a First Amendment action by a date certain would result in forfeiture of plaintiff's right of recovery with prejudice. Remember, there was an order. He had to file his First Amendment action by a certain date or, or forget it. Well, that's what this is. We're, we've not, we find that this is true. The magistrate and parties were duly notified of plaintiff's leave of court and were given 33 days in which to show cause why the order should not take effect or should be modified. The magistrate and the parties re remained silent. By their lack of action and lack of objection, they tacitly agreed with the order. A First Amendment action was filed in the court on June 7th. 
The deputy clerk of this court, by her own certified admission, see it's certified. You know, certified records, you know how it is that you, uh, you get, uh, <clears throat> if, there's, if there's something, you have to have an affidavit. But the government does not produce affidavits. They produce certified somethings, whatever it is. That's the governmental equivalent of an affidavit. So, <clears throat> anyway, we have on this government document um, her admission. <clears throat> the, the deputy clerk of this court, by her own certified admission, did not collude with the magistrate. However, she did accept, via undue influence, the magistrate's unauthorized redirection of her duties, which, which resulted in the vacating of the plaintiff's first amended action. <clears throat> now, here's something else I want to point out. Uh, <clears throat> when, when we were making the motion for contempt of court, we were wearing the plaintiff's hat, the injured party's hat. <clears throat> so, we went hell-bent for leather, right? We're, we're, we're out to slash anybody. They're guilty. They did this, blah, 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 okay? Because when you are the plaintiff, even though you're trying to be fair, you are an, accusa an accuser, you're in an accusatory mode, and you do make some very strong statements against the opposition. That's to be expected, right? Okay, but this is different. This is now, he took his plaintiff's hat off, and he put on his tribunal hat. And you're writing this, and now you have to go down the center of the road. And so, we're looking at this, and we're saying, well, you know, the clerk wasn't really that bad. What really happened was, no, she didn't collude. What happened was she got ordered, you know, and this type of thing. So, that's, this is writing, the style of writing here is now toward the center. That's what I want you to notice, okay? <clears throat> that is to say, her will was overpowered, and she was induced to do an act which she would not do if left to act freely. She was deprived of free agency so that her will was replaced by the will of the magistrate. Specifically, she says that the court directed said clerk to reject the above document. And because of that, quote, the said clerk petitions this court that a, a order be made vacating, which in turn leads to the order that, quote, pursuant to the certificate of the clerk in good cause appearing, it is hereby ordered that the First Amendment action of trespass and trespass on the case is hereby vacated, end quote. Removing the clerk from this anomaly of logic, we are asked to believe that because the court directed the rejecting of the document, the court then ordered the document vacated. <clears throat> because this court did not direct the clerk to reject the document, right? It wasn't this court. It was a judge doing something. Okay? So we never lose sight of the fact who's the court and who's the judge and so forth. And because there was no notice and no hearing on the matter, this is an attempt to commit a fraud upon the court under color of law. Okay? <clears throat> the magistrate of this court, by his own admission, directed the clerk to reject the first amended complaint. And you see these like note 12 and note 13. We're citing back to, we're citing back to that, that transcript or whatever. Okay? <clears throat> then the clerk submitted her certificate. The magistrate, by his own admission, without the benefit of notice to the parties or open court or hearings, signed the order under color of law vacating a First Amendment action previously authorized by order of this court. Though also by his own admission, he has no claim against the plaintiff and knows of no one who does have a relevant claim against the plaintiff. Remember when we asked that question back there? Yeah. Do you have a claim against me? That's another important point. Sometimes you just say, do you have a claim against me? He says, no, you can hold it against him later. The magistrate is a person appointed or elected to perform ministerial service in a court of record because all judicial functions in a court of record are reserved to the tribunal which must be independent of the magistrate. The magistrate of this court has usurped, that means grab control of, right? Um, has usurped the independent powers of the tribunal of this court of record <coughs> by making discretionary judgments which are reserved to and should have been made by the tribunal independently of the person of the magistrate designated generally to hold it. And we have another note referring to the definition of a court of record. The magistrate of this court, by his own admission, antecedent to any hearing by the court or notice to any of the parties under color of law, usurped the authority of the court and directed the clerk of the court to reject the first amended action. The magistrate of this court 
By the way, I want you to also notice in this style, you notice that we get a little bit repetitive? Yeah. You should avoid, to some degree, uh, pronouns. Yeah. 